to the session, uh, first session on Friday morning, 16th October, session is called Open Risk Assessment Methods and Expertise. Um, I hope we have wonderful speakers and we have a wonderful audience and I hope we will have great discussions after each of the presentations. Before I start, I would like to present um, the, uh, the um, chair of this morning session. I would like to start with myself, I'm Elke Anklam. I'm from the European Commission's Joint Research Center, and I'm responsible for one of the seven scientific institutes. I would like to pass the microphone to my co-chairs. Good morning, I'm Rob Doubleday. I'm director of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. And I hope you will appreciate the fact that by having four chairs, we are trying to model and experiment some crowdsourced uh, conference chairing I think it's true that the spirit that we want to run through this session is one of openness and dialogue, because that's the theme, but also how we want to run it. So we're looking forward to lots of questions and comments from the floor. And I will be convening the closing session at the end, which again, we hope will be an opportunity for you to reflect on what you've heard and bring comments and questions at that point. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Sato. Uh, I'm from uh, Food Safety Commission of Japanese government. I worked as a member of the commission, uh, as a chairperson of that commission. Uh, it is a great opportunity to be here and uh, to chair uh, th this kind of session. The exp expert is uh, uh, very much different from mine, but uh, I will try to uh, chair this session. Yes, good morning. My name is Rainer Witkowski. I'm the vice president of the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment in Berlin. So I think we have a very important topic today because we know what state of the art, we know what kind of expertise we need when we do risk assessments, but there is a, a further need to come from transparency to openness, and this is a very critical point and uh, I, I think we have to discuss this because we have a situation in Germany at the moment, uh, a discussion about glyphosate where the public and the politics are mainly trying to influence the risk assessment from the scientific point of view. And this is a very critical point, so I think this is exactly the edge we are talking today. So I will have the final session, I will lead the final session before the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh dear colleagues here on the panel. And uh, I would like to also uh, mention and thank already our rapporteurs, uh, two uh, colleagues from EFSA, it is Tom Mavis and Didier Fellow, and they will make sure that everything what we say here and you discuss here is going to a nice report. Um, before we start, just a few words about this session. It is absolutely clear, we as citizens, consumers, and, and sometimes we, we read some reports. Here we are these spe oh, many specialists, but I now imagine you are a normal consumer citizen, and you read something about whatever risk of something in your diet. Yes, you have to trust what, what information you get there, because not everybody is a specialist in the area. But it is absolutely important that we have a full transparency on, on issues which are really right to the heart of, of consumers. Uh, we should not forget that we sometimes get some contradictory messages even, even concerning risk assessment or the output or outcome of risk assessment. And uh, I think it is absolutely important that we have a very close dialogue with the other stakeholders, including the uh, individual citizens. Um, the session is transparency in risk assessment, openness. Um, EFSA has launched a number of initiatives and activities in this area already. 
Um, we will today also discuss about the methods and expertise, knowledge and the knowledge transfer we have to have there and it is absolutely clear whatever is done in order to get acceptance by consumers of the final opinion or of the policy maker, we need to use sound methods, we need to have fit for the purpose methodologies in order to make really sure that the messages coming from the scientists are heard and implemented. So this session will explore all of the challenges we have in this respect and we also will discuss state of the art of methodologies. So we stop here because it is more important to listen to our experts and um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of this morning and this is Professor Gerard de Vries. He is from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands and uh, he has been having several positions in several universities, including University of Maastricht. He, is also, he has done a lot of studies that led to advisory reports, for example, on risk policy. So we have a real expert here today with us who will then talk to us about from science in society to science with society. Professor de Vries, please uh, go ahead. First, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me um, to address you. Ladies and gentlemen, the past decades have seen a host of initiatives to enhance public involvement in the assessment and decision processes related to potential health and environmental risks. Some of them originated from government agencies, others emerged bottom-up locally or were initiated by NGOs. The ambitions differ. Some initiatives aim to improve the communication from science towards the public. Others try to institute consultation by encouraging information flow from the public to science. And the more radical ones seek to introduce public participation models drawn from politics or from the law into risk governments. Whatever form is chosen, they require the risk governments community to interact with the public, a rather fake term that most of the time does not refer to the whole population, but to those who are concerned about a specific topic, individual citizens, NGOs, unions, as well as spokespersons from uh, companies and industry associations. I do think that honest theory demands that to concede that the experience with these initiatives has varied. Although there are some well-documented success stories, many initiatives have ended in frustration to some or to all who have been concerned. Time and again, the public discovered that when all was said and done, their involvement had little impact on the decisions that were subsequently made. Policymakers have been accused of hypocrisy and of considering public involvement cynically as a just an irritant obstacle that they have to overcome before getting back to business as usual. On the other side, scientific experts have complained about the low quality of the deliberation and have argued that before the public should become uh, uh, involved more fruitfully, they should have uh, be taught the basic principles of science, to which the public reacted by accusing scientists of being arrogant technocrats and having little respect for democratic principles. One need not be a cynic to look at the initiative to enhance public involvement with science and technology with some skepticism. So are they a bad idea and should we forget about them? The morning is fresh, so let's not rush to conclusions. I will proceed in three steps. I will first discuss shortly the motivations that led to these in initiatives. Then I will point to the framework in which we tend to discuss these initiatives, one that suggests a specific view on the role of science in society. 
And certainly, finally, I will suggest another framework, one that I think may help to shift the current discussion about these initiatives into a more fruitful direction. The chairperson also already mentioned food safety provides an excellent example to discuss the issue that public involvement in matters that depend on scientific expertise raise. Food has never been safer than today. As consumers, we blindly assume that the industry and regulators have taken care of food safety. We upload our supermarket carts without fear of being poisoned. But as citizens, we are confronted with a flood of news items that make us worry. Overweight and obesity engulf the globe. The chronic diseases that, cause, uh, that they will cause will have a crushing weight on public health budgets. How come? Are the excessive amount of sugar sold and all unhealthy fats in processed food not a food safety issue? The next day we read about food scare. Yes, we are old enough to remember the BSE crisis. We also learn about NGOs questioning the long-term safety of GM food. So we wonder whether we should perhaps change our diet. We depend on safe food and so do our children and grandchildren. So what's going on? We want to have a say, we raise our voice, we join some in local initiative, sign up for an NGO, write a blog and send some tweets. We become active citizens. At this point, regulators, politicians, the industry, food safety experts start worrying. Should they take action? In broad outline, there are three different reasons to do so. The first reason is the markets ask for it. Trade thrives on trust. If public confidence in science and risk assessment and risk management erodes, it may have detrimental economic effects. A food scare may ignite a buyer strike that may bring businesses and even whole sectors onto its knees. Lack of confidence thrives in the dark. Science used to be the trusted authority in matters of health and safety. If we want the public to trust scientists, they better work, conduct their work in full light. Full transparency, opening up the process of scientific assessment of risk and allowing the public to comment and to contribute to it in one way or another are believed in helping to building and if necessary, restoring public trust in science. A second reason, science asks for it. Scientific expertise has its limits, although in many cases it is possible to assess risks on the basis of solid scientific evidence. In other cases, uncertainties about these risks remain because the data are, in, are incomplete, because there is conflicting evidence or disagreement between different disciplinary approaches, because methods to re reliable estimate the risks are simply not available or because the projected outcomes are evaluated radically different. As Ortwin Renn and others have argued, the various situations that uh, may occur call for quite different risk government strategies. In case of complex risk problems, to seek consensus Discussion between representatives of different disciplines is called for. When uncertainty is imminent, a precaution-based management strategy may have to be adopted. When deep con value conflicts show up, a participative discourse with stakeholders is the preferred way to go. Facing uncertainty and controversy, step by step, the circle of people who, that need to be included becomes larger and larger. A third reason for these initiatives is politics asks for it. 
In the past decades, the role of science in politics has changed. Today, to a large extent, the political agenda is defined by outcomes of research. Citizens can detach stench themselves and their protests may urge politicians to take action. But that regulation is required because exposure to some chemical may cause cancer in the decades ahead is known only because of the work scientists have invested in the matter. So politicians and public turn their eye to science only to find scientists to disagree and to be uncertain about important issues. So again, the public starts raising its voice and social media allow them to express their concerns loudly to enable a serious, orderly, democratic debate requires instituting new platforms for dialogue, new forms of mediation. So there are at least three reasons, good reasons, for taking initiatives the public, uh, to involve the public in risk governments. However, each of these reasons is also quite problem problematic. So let's get back to them for a minute. Yes, trade thrives on trust. But trust is a precious good. Trust is not something you can ask for without immediately throw sowing distrust. If you don't believe me, do a little experiment. On the return from this conference, ask your partner blind, bluntly, do you trust me? Even if she or he immediately confirms his or her trust in you, your partner will likely want to know, why did you ask? Should I worry? Probably you'll need in the weeks to come to restore confidence at home. If an organization starts to emphasizing the transparency of its processes, people will likely start wondering what else they have to hide. Yes. Second reason, scientific expertise may run against limits. So there are good reasons to open up discussions and to get outsiders involved. But conditions apply. Science is a collective learning process that requires participants to work according to professional standards. If citizens and other stakeholders won't, don't comply to these standards, adding their contribution will only corrupt the excellence we expect from science. So stakeholders are required to communicate their comments and data within a highly structured format. However, that leaves those who, for whatever reason, want to challenge the procedures and the views that inspire the format, only two options, either to comply or to leave the stage. And in both cases, they will probably be, uh, be frustrated. Finally, also the initiative that explicitly addressed the political demands require raise questions. What's the political legitimacy of the stakeholders and citizens who raise their voices? Often, and if not always, a minority of concerned citizens. What weight should a consensus, if it is reached, have for those who are democratically elected to legitimately represent the public and who have the task to balance this confidence, this consensus against the wide range of other interests. So to sum up, the initiatives to involve the public in the processes of risk government are confronted with at least three problems. Does transparency really contribute to restoring trust? The risk of corrupting science and the questions about political legitimacy. And perhaps you can see that is a remarkable shift. We started with, does the public trust science? And suddenly we are in a discussion whether, whether science can trust the public. That's a remarkable shift. That's what I want to do. But let's not overreact. The ambitions to involve the public in risk governments differ. 
many seek to stretch existing practices only a bit. To use focus groups and questionnaires to listen to the public is not so different, of course, from what marketing departments all over the world do anticipate the preferences of their clients, uh, their businesses' clients. Nor is it different from what politicians do when they discuss an issue with their party members before they take a stand in Parliament. And an invitation to stakeholders to add data and to comment on a well-structured platform is not so different from an, assi from an assignment a uh, scientist must give, must, may give to one of his students. All of that fits easily into our ideas, ideas about democracy and about science. But if that is all there is, people are likely to be disappointed. Why? Because many of the initiatives we are discussing come with larger aspirations, namely to contribute to the revitalization of democracy in technology, uh, technologically advanced societies. As long as science, politics, and the business world stay put in their own house, to only tender front gardens to ease public access, there is little problem. But the issues that have to be discussed are often closely intertwined economic, scientific, and political ones. Then, living apart together is no longer an option. Then, science and politics have to meet on common ground, and soon we end up with, uh, with the tempestuous marriages. Why? Because the arrangements that are created do not any longer frame, uh, fit into the framework in which, on which we rely to discuss the role of science in democracy. What is that framework? Intellectually, we have everything arranged in proper order. We have built a robust framework in a few steps. First, we have separated nature and society as two separate realms, namely the domain of the non-humans, that's nature, and the domain of humans, that is society. Then, science becomes that part of society that has unique access to nature. The function of science is to produce valid, reliable knowledge about nature. Politics and the markets are also subsystems of society. Their function is to distribute values and interests in different ways. Of course, there are interactions between science, politics, and markets. But the key point is that these interactions should not interfere with the proper function of each of these subsystems, because that will corrupt their function. If science interferes too much in politics, we end up in technocracy. If politics interferes with science, ideology rather than truth will be produced. All of this may seem obvious, but we should realize that there are good reasons to draw up another framework. And for this, we may turn to one of the great scientists of the 19th century, Louis Pasteur, one of the founder, founding fathers of microbiology. Pasteur's research led him not only to change his views about nature, but also to change his views about society. Having identified microbes and their role in spreading diseases, Pasteur realized, as he wrote in one of his papers, there are more of us than we thought. If we want to talk about human lives and interaction, about what we conventionally call society, we better take non-human entities like microbes into account. We, stop sh we should stop conceiving nature and society as two separate realms. Microbes exist, and to stop them uh, spreading diseases, requires reorganizing human practices. Waterworks and sewerage have to be designed as separate systems, hygienic meshes to be introduced, etc. 
Once all of that was in place, human life expectancy increased spectacularly. The French philosopher and anthropologist Bruno Latour has argued that we should take Pasteur's lesson to heart. He suggested that Pasteur's work might be used to conceive another framework to discuss the role of science in democracy. In Latour's framework, the world is conceived as what he calls a collective of humans and non-humans elements that relate in many ways. As a consequence, when we discuss the governance of collectives of the world, we have to acknowledge that we do not only have to take the powers of humans, of people and businesses and states into account, but also the power of the non-human elements, of microbes, of harmful chemicals, ecosystems, and um, today also of the global climate. Two questions need then to be addressed. First, which human and non-human powers do we have to take into account? And secondly, how do we rearrange a collective in such a way that these powers fit together in an ordered collective and hopefully not all too uh, problematic way? Each of these two questions requires two tasks. To answer the first question, task, the first task was concerned signally, alerting perhaps, that some new formerly unknown power may have, be, uh, may, uh, have to be taken into account. A second task is to determine what the nature and the characteristics of that power are. The term that Latour suggests for these two tasks are perplexity and consultation. Ugly terms, I agree. The second question, how do we take all these powers into account, requires determining how various powers, how they fit into the collective and to what extent they pose threats to each other. And secondly, to think about how to reorganize the collective to reduce these threats. Latour calls these tasks respectively hierarchization and institution. To govern a collective then becomes the process of subsequently addressing the four tasks, a continuous process that time as time and again new powers may perplex us to ask for another round. <coughs> Latour's work, Latour's idea of governing is clearly modeled on the work of Pasteur and other microbiologists. In the mid-19th century, the variation of virulence of contagious diseases presented quite some problem. That was the problem that got uh, Pasteur started. He succeeded in identifying microbes as the cause of disease, that's perplexity, studied their characteristics, that's consultation, and determined how they contribute to the spreading diseases among the other members of the collective, among humans and cattle. To subsequently suggest ideas how to contain microbes to prevent them from communicating diseases, that's hierarchization. To protect humans and cattle against the undeniable presence of microbes required a combination of technical, economic, social and legal measures. Technical facilities had to be designed, rights and burdens had to be distribu distributed, new forms of behavior to be facilitated and stimulated, and so on and so on, that is institution. Once that had been implemented in cities, in households, in farms and in industry, people started to live healthier lives. Pasteur produced excellent scientific knowledge, lots of it in fact. His collected papers are published in seven thick volumes. But if we want to understand the role of Pasteur's work in society, the scheme that starts with bifurcating nature on the one hand and society on the other hand, 
and that suggests that the function of science is to produce knowledge, knowledge that others, politicians and so on, may subsequently use to attain their own goals, only gives a very limited view on what posture actually uh, achieved. To get a richer, more detailed picture of his role, we have to turn our attention away from knowledge to what Pasteur did, to his the work, to the tasks he to, took up, rather than what he came out of his mind and what was printed on paper. If we make that shift from knowledge to work, we get a better view on how Pasteur and other microbiologists contributed to governing a collective that encompasses both human and non-human elements. Pasteur was active on all four tasks. <laughs> By introducing this framework, this view on the process of governing a collective, Latour does not present some utopia, nor does he call for a revolution. He claims that he is simply redescribing what has become common practice for more than a century to produce a more realistic picture. Consider, for example, the EU framework for food safety governments. As many studies have shown, the official picture that assigns risk assessment to the scientists and decision making and risk management to the politicians only presents a shadow of what is actually uh, going on. And it takes a little effort, I think, to re-describe what is actually going on, the work that is going on in EFSA and in the, in the committee um, uh, more realistically in the terms suggested by this picture. Scientists are contributing to governance, but they're certainly not the only ones. They do it side by side with many others, with politicians, economists, lawyers, social sciences, and many others. In all countries in the world, they meet in hybrid assemblies. Each discipline Con cover, uh, contributes in its own way. But their contributions are badly covered by the terms that the conventional framework that we use suggests, namely that the role of scientists is to establish facts of nature, while politicians, economists, and lawyers deal with the distribution of values and interests. Latour suggests that we get a more adequate picture if we focus on what they may contribute to each of the four tasks of the process of governing a collective. The difference, is, the difference is not one between contributing facts and distributing values, rather they bring different skills and instruments to the whole job of governments. What are these skills and instruments? First, consider the scientists. They bring to the task of perplexity the asset of their curiosity and open minds, plus the laboratory instruments that allow them to detect scarcely visible phenomena and formerly unknown entities and powers. By designing suitable experiments to articulate the characteristics uh, and powers of these entities, scientists contribute to the work of consultation. Moreover, to the third task, hierarchization, they have the competence to offer heterogeneous innovations and compromises that may help to reduce conflicts. Finally, scientists also have the knack of knowing how to institute an entity. They know that when all is said and done, outcomes of research have to be accepted as hard facts. Once it is convincingly shown that microbes exist, and they cause diseases, spread diseases, we cannot lie any longer deny their existence and better have, accept that we have to live with them and to turn to the question how this can be achieved in a for humans and cattle 
less detrimental way. Second, consider the role of politicians. They too contribute to each of these four tasks, with, but with different skills and different instruments than scientists. Politicians can contribute by being attentive to the worries and concerns of their citizens, that is perplexity. The second task is to form concerned parties, reliable witnesses, to mobilize stakeholders, to ensure a wide variety of, fo of voices, that is consultation. Politicians have the skill to find compromises and persuade the ones they represent to accept them, that is hierarchization, and the craft to make painful decisions, accepting the fact that building a collective sometimes also means to exclude and to make enemies, that is institution. So it's beyond any question <coughs> that scientists, politicians, econo economists, and lawyers have different roles in risk governments. But to get these differences into view, Latour claims that we should focus on what they do, and thus on their skills and the instruments they bring to the job. That is, to the four tasks that he, uh, Latour distinguishes. Once we got that message, we may start wondering which skills and instruments other parties may contribute to the process of governing. Lawyers, social sciences, NGOs, and of course also citizens. Scientists, economists, politicians, and many others meet in hybrid assemblies in Brussels, in Washington, and in any capital in the world. Visit any of the major institutions that help governing the world EFSA, the FAO, the World Health Organization, the OECD, IPCC, you name it, or visit a ministerial department uh, and you will meet scientists, economists, lawyers, and politicians in conference. The forms and constitutions of these assemblies vary, of course, widely. Interesting, most of them have only recently been uh, erected in the last four, five, six uh, decades. And that, of course, allows us to imagine other forms of assemblies and to take initiatives to try to innovate and to form new uh, kind of institutions. The world changes, new challenges to, uh, present themselves, and as I've argued, there are good economic, scientific, and political reasons to discuss new ways of involving a wider public in the process of risk governance. We need to experiment and to discuss what happens in these initiatives. But if we continue to discuss these initiatives within the conventional framework, our discussions will likely only end in deadlock and in frustration. We'll conceive those members of the public who intend to contribute as amateurs, who lack the proper background to contribute to science. Before opening their mouth, they should first take a class in advanced statistics. We are also suspicious about who they represent and on what mandate they are speaking. When they are organized in an NGO or other civil society movement, we'll point it to its limited membership and question the political legitimacy of that organization. Meanwhile, their contributions are feared because the internet allows them to communicate, their, to communicate their ideas widely. The media, always eager re to report about controversy, will make it even worse. So we worry that trust and trade may become at stake. Discussing the problems of the new initiatives in these terms is not very helpful, I think. It only leads to deadlocks. The framework Latour suggests provides, I think, a slightly more helpful and fruitful platform. If we sail on that compass, the questions we have to ask is not to the public, what is your political legitimacy, and not do you have the proper background to seriously uh, contribute to science, but the questions that we have to ask is, what skills and instruments do you have to offer to enrich the process of governing in each of the four phases 
perplexity, consultation, organization, and institution. And we may start discussing how their skills and instruments might be improved to allow the public to have a more fruitful role. So what can we expect? First, we should realize that the public is a very broad category. Obviously, a lobbyist who raises his voice in a public meeting has access to more resources than an individual concerned citizen. A global NGO can mobilize more voices than a local citizen group. And let's not forget, many who have raised their voices in public controversies about science had a scientific background. So let's focus on what the weakest group, single individuals without scientific background. What can they bring to the job? Well, to the face of perplexity, they can contribute their local and practical experience drawn from their skills as non-scientific professionals. Remember, the first signals that asbestos presented serious health risks didn't come from science, but came from social workers in asbestos uh, mines. Remember that the workers in the UK slaughterhouses were well aware that it was not possible to comply to the existing rules. As the Phillips report on the BSE crisis shows, the fact that for a long time their experience was ignored has cost the UK dearly. As the literature shows, referring for example to the work of Brian Wynne, to these examples one may add many others. Of course, anecdotal stories from local people and practitioners are not reliable scientific evidence. And some of their stories and worries may be plainly unfounded. But the least one may expect is that they are listened to, that their anecdotal evidence is checked and collected and studied for patterns. As to consultation, see what one can achieve by spending a few weekends on the internet. Again, what one encounters is on the net is not necessarily reliable information. It has to be checked, discussed, and it may turn out to be nonsense. But isn't that true also for many contributions to run-of-the-mill science? The internet provides the public with the means to consult and mobilize others, and suddenly the individual citizen is no longer alone. Citizens who are concerned, who worry, and who are per perhaps and likely excited are not the ones one expect to easily compromise. So when it comes to hierarchization, they're perhaps not the first to step down with, uh, step forward with fruitful ideas. But there are means to stimulate them to change that attitude. Games, social simulations, and other forms of mediation may help to find ways to get a reasonable discussion. Again, we may learn something from their practical skills. See what a weekend with a group of concerned citizens in some resort can do. So finally, what about institution? Being someone who believes in the merits of science, in representative democracy, and in the checks and balances that are the, rule to, uh, to, uh, that are the key to a rule of law, here I make a stop. When it comes to attain closure of deliberation, to decide what should be conceived as hard fact, and how a democracy should be decide on what needs to be done, I think we should recur to the procedures that have proven their merit. But beware, the process of governing does end in closure only for the time being. At any moment, problems may be signals that ask for another round of perplexity, consultation, organization, and institution. Ladies and gentlemen, what motivates public involvement in risk governments are questions about public trust in science, a very precious good. But in discussing these initiatives, the question is often turned around to become, can we scientists trust the public, rather than does the public trust the sciences? Does the public have anything to contribute that might be of scientific value? And besides from that, what is the political legitimacy of those who raise their voice? 
I don't think that these are the questions, the right questions to be asked. The public doesn't want to contribute to science. They ask for a force in risk governance because that is what matters to their lives and to the lives of their children. They want to add their voice to the process side by side to the voices that already have found their place. So instead of the questions that are often raised, I think the question that have to be raised is what skills and instruments might the public add to the process of governing the collective? And how can we improve the process of risk governments to allow them to have a more fruitful role. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor de Vries, for this excellent, really fascinating and stimulating keynote speech. And really, there are so many points I think we could write, go and discuss many of them. I think we could allow maybe one burning question now because Professor de Vries will go back to the panel later on at the end of the session. Is there anybody who would like to say something now? Okay, then perfect. Okay. I'm looking forward to further discussions later on. Thanks once more.